because as you saw, there was only one nuclear product. A nuclear reaction requires two products to dissipate its energy by conserving momentum. So that one product goes in one direction, the other product goes in the opposite direction, such as to balance the momentum and carry away the energy. We have only one product. That problem created the need to explain this, this problem with a very complex series, some of which you saw yesterday. However, it's possible to explain this in a very simple way, and that is by the electrons that are in the nuclear active environment and are used to uh, overcome the Coulomb barrier, they themselves are emitted and carry away the energy. The other nuclear products result from secondary reactions uh, that uh, have been detected. So let's go on to the next next slide, uh, hopefully. There we go. So let me explain using another cartoon what I think is happening. And this um, green glob uh, represents all of the electrons in the nuclear environment that are available to interact with the two nuclei of deuterium that find, have found themselves in that uh, environment. The electrons interact neutralizing the re natural repulsion, the Coulomb barrier, bringing these two nuclei closer together. As they get closer together, their nuclear energy states start to interact. Because the electrons are also there, those electrons interact with those nuclear energy states, creating a combined energy state. This is where the mystery lies. This is a, an incredibly new structure, never seen before, never considered before. It's a combination of neutrons, protons, and electrons. Now, that energy state contains an enormous amount of energy, 23.85 MeV to be exact. It has to dissipate that. There are several ways that can happen. One way is for all of the electrons that are in that structure to go off in one direction and the nuclear product, helium, to go off in the other direction. I explored that particular model in a paper that's already been published. It makes it possible to calculate the number of electrons and their energy, but it does not fully explain the behavior of the energy that has been measured for the nuclear product. The other possibility is half the electrons go in one direction and the other half go in the other direction, thus bouncing the uh, momentum and carrying away all the energy, leaving the nuclear product stationary. It would not have to move. If there is an imbalance between those two, by chance, then the, the uh, nuclear product would move to correct that imbalance. When an effort is made to resolve that using momentum conservation, we run into problems. So there is a further mystery associated with this mechanism. Let's look at the electrons. The, these, this, the electrons that have been emitted can be measured simultaneously with the uh, power. I've done this, you, Jean-Paul, have done that. If the emitted electrons are measured and such that a voltage is applied between the collector and the uh, emitter, so that electrons having energy less than that voltage are returned to the emitter, the power that you measure will go down, or the amount of current will go down. And that's demonstrated here as the voltage has increased. About, so these electrons have a lot of energy, and at least half of them have an energy greater than 100 EV. This is far more energy than can be uh, generated by a chemical process. This has to be nuclear. But if you look at the effect of time on that measurement, you discover that there is an effect of time as the voltage has changed. And when 100 volts is applied, the 
the uh, power, the number of electrons increases, and so does the power. I can explain that, but um, not now. I don't have enough time for that. Let's look at the next slide. This is a measurement of the energy of the emitted nuclear product, not the energy of the, of the electrons. It has a very strange behavior consisting of a series of, of uh, energies all separated equally. When the two measurements, the one done in Russia and the one done in the United States are co-plotted, they agree with one another quite nicely and they all extrapolate to zero. I don't have time to go into the details of this, but this really needs to be replicated and uh, analyzed properly because it gives uh, an insight into the nature of the nuclear process. So let's go to the summary. The conditions required to create fusion energy. We have to make the nuclear reactor environment. The material must be exposed to an isotope of hydrogen, preferably deuterium. The fuel must be caused to move more rapidly from its normal location. Now there's two warnings that people need to take into account who are trying to apply this on a large scale. The nuclear active environment is expected to have a lifetime. As large amounts of power are produced, the nuclear products will accumulate and the nuclear active environment will gradually be destroyed. So the, the Generators must be designed in such a way that the material in the generator that is supporting the fusion reaction can be changed out, put in new material. The second problem comes with the use of hydrogen. Ordinary hydrogen is expected to produce tritium, not helium. The people who see mass three in their mass spectrum, I propose are seeing tritium. Tritium decays into helium. And so if you see any helium, it would be the result of the decay of tritium. This kind of reaction is now numerous times. So you don't want to have tritium being produced in your uh, commercial generator. So I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank okay. you very much. Thank, Thank you very much, Ed. We have time for a couple of questions. Yeah, one here, Bob. Thank you very much for your uh, talk, uh, Dr. Edmund Storms, uh, Bob Greenier, Martin Fleisch Memorial Project. Uh, can you um, go into a little more detail as to what you mean by electron clusters and how they cluster? Well, I, that is uh, one of the great mysteries. We know that electrons can cluster uh, around nuclei. They form what is believed to be a um, planetary kind of arrangement, but more sophisticated in terms of, of a plasma uh, cloud. Uh, so we know they can cluster that way. Uh, Ken Shoulders found that they cl can cluster other ways. So there's a variety of different ways in which they cluster. All I can say is they cluster in such a way as to allow fusion to take place. I don't Thank know why I'm to do that. That's where the Nobel Prize is located. <laughs> Thank you.